terms of the uh, um, of the conference schedule, we're going to give you a quick reprise. There we go. If we can get the um, whoops, slides up there. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we're planning to do and also how we're hoping that obviously all of you will participate in the Health Canada consultation. We are quite pleased, um, I think, with uh, our ability to collaborate and cooperate with Health Canada. We are hoping that at the end of this, we will have great consensus around what a program going forward would look like. Um, I am having a little struggle with whether we started calling it a program and we're not really sure if that's the right word. We have called it a framework, we've called it a strategy. I'd be very interested in other people's thoughts in terms of what makes the most sense in terms of how we're framing it. But um, I think we are very pleased that we're seeing forward. So as you know, uh, we're this week we'll be doing a our webinar uh, providing you with some really, I think, more drill down information in terms of how other countries provide access to rare disease drugs. So what can it can learn or not? There's some great lessons from it, maybe not some others. Next um, session we will be doing will be February the 12th. And we hope that uh, you really will join us because what we would like to do is devote the entire time to talking about the uh, Health Canada's discussion guide towards this rare disease drug strategy. Uh, we will hopefully have some opportunities for um, people to kind of propose what their thoughts are. We would like to kind of make an opportunity for everybody to be able to share and not to say that we want to dictate kind of what will be said, but I think it's great for us to, to be able to have the opportunities to, to swap and share the information. So the 12th will really be hopefully a highly interactive session in which we'll have the opportunity to really look at what Health Canada is putting out for consultations and having everybody uh, share into that. Um, and then we're going to, on the 18th, have a very specific session that will be in the evening. So we're in the evening. We wanna be able to capture some people who may not be able to do it during the daytime, and especially for some of our patient or patient groups or people that have got other jobs, real life, other than, you know, kind of hanging out with rare diseases. And, uh, you know, so we wanna provide an, an hour or so for, for everybody to come in and maybe a, again, that drill down on what is it we hear there, maybe a bit more of a Q and A. We will have uh, invite some of you to actually be speakers on that so that we can help guide everybody through that process. And then on the 26th, which will be our Rare Disease Day celebration, we're going to put out some um, opportunities for people to participate with us. It, it, for me, it's a great combination in terms of a celebration and also obviously some of the challenges still going forth with this rare disease strategy, drug strategy front and center. Um, so this is what we're doing. We will, um, as you know, we've got our conference coming up. I don't know if that's the next slide, Ange. Yes. So we will have our Rare Disease Day conference, obviously a lot different than it has been. Last year, our Rare Disease Day conference was in Ottawa. And it was on the same dates, the 9th and the 10th. But uh, obviously, we're full days in Ottawa. Some of you will remember we had a march on Park to Parliament Hill during that time. It was freezing cold with rain coming down on us. We've got some great photos on that. Only goes to show you what perseverance will do. Um, it was a great opportunity to bring everybody together. Obviously, we're not going to do that uh, this year, but uh, and it will be a bit shorter because it is hard for people to sit for the whole day. And we will focus very much in terms of what is the actual plan for a uh, rare drug strategy. So this is something that uh, we're hoping everybody will engage in. We'll be doing it with some presentations, but also some very much uh, interactive sessions as well. So really inviting everybody to sign up for it, to take part in it with us. And... Um, I don't know what's on the next slide there. Is that, oh yeah, back up. Okay, this is just again, this high level, what we're gonna do. Um, we hope to have a consolidated design by April 12th. Health Canada, as you will know, announced their series of town hall meetings. They wanna be done by the end of March, which signals to us we need to be done by the end of March. If indeed there is a spring election, uh, which may be a bit more wavering now in terms of, uh, I guess, where the poll numbers are sitting for the liberals, we shall see, um, you know, but, the plan is to have something that we can put out uh, and be used as a further consultation, not a finished plan by the end, uh, by the beginning of April. And then hopefully by the end of the summer, then have a collaborative proposal going forward. Next slide, please. So this is for those of you who have not seen it, but uh, hopefully you have. Um, this is what Health Canada has put out now for their, what they call national strategy for high cost drugs for rare diseases, their online engagement. Um, there is an online questionnaire, uh, which only has about, I think, nine questions in it, but there's some open-ended questions. So 
uh, it may take a little time to fill it out. We really encourage people to take a look at it. We would, are going to be hosting some sessions, sharing what we think, inviting some of you to come on as well to share what you think, and maybe get people thinking collaboratively or at least swapping intelligence before we go into uh, the actual filling out of it. We, there are options, and you can send that written submission by email or, or by mail. Um, there will be then this series of public town hall meetings. There are six of them. They've only given dates for the first five. Four of them are bilingual. One of them is in French only. Uh, and absolutely encourage people to go onto the website to sign up for the town hall meetings and to make sure that you know, you're heard. In addition, there are going to be round tables, stakeholder round tables, which will be for the patients. There will be stakeholder round tables for healthcare professionals, and there will be stakeholder round tables for um, the industry and for other um, um, stakeholders, I'm not exactly sure how they're breaking them all out. I think those will be mostly by invitation. Um, so, you know, uh, look, you know, stay tuned and see. The patients roundtables are actually starting next week. So some of you may have already received an invitation for either the second or the fifth. Those will be starting right off the bat. So they really are on a, um, everybody's on a bit of a hurry up schedule. So this is great that we've been having these discussions since last fall. Next slide. Okay, so this is gonna be our guide for today. Maybe a little bit different format than originally talked about. Um, I'm really thrilled to, you know, we're gonna talk about, you know, uh, as I said, we're gonna have a presentation on the five international approaches to um, pricing and reimbursement for rare disease drugs, ultra rare disease drugs. We saw a little bit of a, this um, in our conference in December, have a much more drill down in, in this case. And we've got three discussion questions that we'll be putting forth to our panel, but also open for you folks to comment as well. Okay, um, next slide. So this is our panel. So the presenter will be Tanya Stefinski from the University of Alberta, who is one of the code leads for the PRISM project. And so she'll be presenting on these different um, models that are used in, in the other countries. We've got a great uh, discussion panel, uh, uh, Norm Burbridge from Takeda, who, um, I think many of you will know um, and um, has been a great friend for us in terms of helping advance um, the certainly the knowledge here around uh, the industry of perspectives around rare diseases. Takeda has really taken on, I think, what a vengeance their role in terms of rare diseases. So we're quite thrilled in terms of their continued partnership. Angela Diano with Alpha One Canada, one of our really leading patient advocates and has really emerged as a very informed leader, but also a great uh, leader for her community. So thrilled that she was willing to step into this panel. And then Dr. Ken Chapman from the University of Toronto. Hooray, hooray. I'm so pleased. It's so very, very important for us in order to have uh, the, the healthcare professionals take a role. So we appreciate it. We know how challenging it is for people to move out of clinics and to be able to come on to this. So, you know, really want to thank you for doing that. The format may be a little bit different than we originally thought. We've, you know, we've got, um, we'll do a po portion of the presentations. We're gonna do a polling question. And then we're gonna ask the panel maybe to respond to what, uh, what they heard on the presentation, but also uh, to what the poll, uh, polling questions came up with and, and whether or not they agree, disagree, how it affects their community. We'll do another segment in the presentations, have another polling question. So we'll go back and forth between the presentations and uh, a polling question and responses from the panel. That's okay with people. All right. Well, if it isn't, that's too bad because the way it has to go anyway. So <laughs> off we go. And, uh, you know, Angela, I'll let you start with the uh, presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tanya Stavinsky, uh, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about um, value-based pricing and coverage uh, decision-making for therapies that target very rare conditions, looking at uh, pricing and reimbursement in systems with universal or national phar pharma care in five major European pharmaceutical markets. I'll also mention recent efforts uh, to improve consistency of these processes across Europe. So here's an outline of the questions that I hope to be able to address today. Uh, first, what are pricing and reimbursement processes? So what do we mean by that? What do pricing and reimbursement processes for drugs for rare diseases look like 
in the major European uh, pharmaceutical markets. What factors do they consider when making coverage decisions for drugs for very rare conditions? What roles do patients play and how is uncertainty around a drug's clinical and or economic impact managed? And what is known about the impact of these processes on access to certain high cost drugs? We'll also talk about to what extent uh, decisions have been linked to real world evidence-based agreements. So those are also sometimes referred to as managed access programs. Uh, what are the main types of real world evidence-based agreements? And how have patients been involved in decisions around the terms or conditions of uh, these types of agreements in these markets. So first, in most countries with public or socially insured healthcare systems, inpatient and outpatient pharmaceuticals are a part of the services provided. That means decisions on pricing and reimbursement are closely linked and made within the context of a national population with opportunity for greater purchasing power and greater certainty for manufacturers that they will receive expected revenues given volume and a negotiated price. To accomplish this, the evaluations are centralized. Now the five European markets I'll talk about all fall within the top 10 pharmaceutical markets worldwide based on market share in terms of total pharmaceutical sales. And uh, just for your reference, Canada is actually number 10. All of these systems are universal pharmacare systems. The five markets are France, Germany, the UK, Italy, and Spain. Collectively, they represent the two major types of socialized healthcare. So there's universal compulsory statutory health insurance and there's universal tax funded health care. In the first, health insurance is mandatory for all citizens and it's financed through compulsory contributions to insurance funds based on income. Under the second, which is the universal tax funded health insurance, funding comes from general taxation. France and Germany have health insurance um, that's statutory uh, through insurance funds, whereas the UK, Italy, and Spain have tax funded uh, healthcare systems. In terms of reimbursement and pricing pathways for drugs for the very rare diseases and typically the, um, the, the rarest of the ones with um, a, a treatment, the extent to which processes differ from standard ones does vary. In France, once regulatory approval is granted for any innovative drug, the steps it must go through depend upon the anticipated budget impact of that drug. So first, an innovative drug is one associated with a new type of care that may bring a clinically significant advance to compared to what is available or that meets a need not sufficiently covered. Then if its budget impact is less than 30 million euros annually per indication, its therapeutic value is considered proven at regulatory approval and it is fully reimbursed at the manufacturer's price. If it exceeds 30 million euros, its therapeutic value, which is really its clinical benefit, gets assessed by the National Health Technology Assessment Body and a recommendation is made to the Ministries of Health and Budget who together make a final decision. The National Union of Health Insurance Funds then determines the level of reimbursement based on the HGA body's assessment of therapeutic value and the seriousness of the disease to be treated. Drugs for serious and debilitating diseases that lack alternatives are 100% reimbursed. In terms of pricing, its relative therapeutic value is considered along with patient population size and budget impact. Those offering moderate or major improvements must have prices consistent with those charged in Germany, the UK, Italy, and Spain. Now France has had historically good access to rare disease drugs through price volume agreements or real world evidence-based agreements uh, or otherwise called managed access programs that we'll talk a bit about later. But briefly, 
Um, these are programs negotiated between manufacturers and payers to provide access to therapy uh, with a requirement for additional specific data to be collected to address uh, identified decision uncertainties. So in France, there isn't a separate process for rare disease drugs per se. What happens is that those that meet the definition of innovative and have an estimated budget impact under those 30 million euros just get to skip the step of having a full HTA done in, or in the, which is part of the standard process. In Germany, when any drug with orphan drug status, which is granted by the European Medicines Agency, uh, receives regulatory approval, it is automatically reimbursed at the price set by the manufacturer for one year. Orphan drugs is another name for a drug that treats rare diseases, for those of you who may not be familiar with that term. If its budget impact is less than 50 million euros, its therapeutic value is considered proven and it is automatically reimbursed at the same price. But if it exceeds 50 million euros, it is also submitted to the country's HTA body for an independent assessment of its scientific evidence, which is then used by its reimbursement decision-making committee to categorize the drug's relative therapeutic value. That reimbursement decision-making body is the same one that looks at new common drugs. So in other words, there isn't a separate committee for orphan drugs. That information is used to negotiate a price with a body that represents the insurance funds. There is only one body that does this on behalf of uh, each of the sickness funds. So um, the sickness funds aren't negotiating coverage and pricing decisions on their own. Uh, that body is the same for all drugs, and it considers not only therapeutic value, but also the prices of comparator drugs and those in other European countries. In the case of drugs for rare diseases, the prices of those for other rare diseases are used in rebate negotiations. When the benefit is considered non-quantifiable because of a high uncertainty in clinical evidence, which is often the case, with drugs that target small populations where large you know, randomized clinical trials are simply infeasible, sickness funds can request that additional data be collected over a fixed period of time, at the end of which the prices are revisited in light of the new evidence as part of real world evidence agreements. Another reason access is high is funds have negotiated substantial discounts following assessment of relative uh, benefit determination. So like in France, there isn't a separate process with a separate decision-making committee for rare disease drugs. Rather, there is an opportunity to bypass that HTA step if the budget impact stays below the 15 mil 50 million uh, euro uh, threshold. In the United Kingdom, these drugs may go through the standard process for common drugs or an entirely separate one designed for highly specialized technologies, which includes drugs. Under this separate process, highly specialized technologies are defined as those for which the target population is so small that treatment is concentrated within a few centers, the condition is chronic and severely debilitating, the technology is expected to be used within the context of a highly specialized service, is likely to have a high acquisition cost, has potential for lifelong use, and there is a need for national commissioning. So if a rare disease drug does not meet all of these criteria, it goes through a standard review process. Now, what I'm going to talk about this morning is just the separate post process. So that's the highly specialized technologies program. The methods used for evaluating drugs through this process are actually broadly similar to its standard process, but with the additional considerations for vulnerability of very small population groups with limited treatment options, the kind and amount of evidence expected, and the challenge for companies needing to make a reasonable return on investment with small populations. The committee who reviews the drug is not the same one who considers drugs through the standard process. 
This committee is made up of experts in rare diseases and patient representatives, and it takes into account a number of factors, including clinical effectiveness, incremental cost effectiveness, and impact beyond direct, direct health benefits. So for example, that could mean things like impact on caregivers, long-term benefits to research and innovation, and impact on the delivery of a specialized service. A couple of years ago, an incremental cost effectiveness ratio threshold or ICER threshold was introduced. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with that term, the ICER is a measure of the cost effectiveness of an intervention. It represents the difference in uh, the costs and the uh, outcomes between those two measured in quality adjusted life years. Typically, it compares the new treatment, in this case, a drug, to standard care. In some places, it is used to judge whether an intervention represents good value for money. Now in this process, a range of values have been set from 100,000 to 300,000 pounds per quality, depending on the quality gained per patient over his or her lifetime. Committee recommendations are typically incorporated into real world evidence agreements or managed access programs that have specified time periods until review, at which point a definitive coverage decision will be made based on the real world evidence collected over that time period. So that's the UK. Now in Italy, a single national body is responsible for managing regulatory approval, reimbursement and pricing. So that's in contrast to France, Germany, and the UK, where separate bodies are responsible for regulatory approval and reimbursement. Within Italy's single national body, there are two committees, one that assesses the added value of drugs, so it's a bit like an HCA function, and then one that negotiates pricing and reimbursement conditions. It's also responsible for establishing the innovative status of drugs for access to special benefits, which is relevant to many of the drugs for very rare conditions. Innovative status is considered in parallel with um, negotiation of pricing and reimbursement. So drugs with full innovative status, which many drugs for rare diseases have, are funded through national budgets once they're assessed. Those deemed to be of exceptional therapeutic and social importance are eligible for a fast track pr procedure in which negotiations are complete, completed within 100 days of filing. Negotiations uh, take into account positive cost effectiveness, uh, which is considered positive if there's no effective therapy, whether it falls above or below an ICER threshold, uh, more favorable risk benefit ratio, budget impact, per day therapy cost, and a comparison of prices and consumption with other countries. In almost all cases, negotiations involve collection of real world evidence through registration managed access programs. Now note that the fast track process involves the same committee who considers the same factors as those for more common drugs. The difference is that the review is prioritized so it can jump the queue, resulting in a shorter time from submission to decision. Such drugs are also eligible for access to special funds for up to 36 months. Now in Spain, access to all drugs, regardless of whether they target a rare or common disorder involves three stages. The granting of regulatory approval by the national regulatory body, negotiating reimbursement and pricing by the Federal Ministry of Health. And then because Spain's healthcare system is decentralized like Canada's, negotiating agreements with regional authorities responsible for financing. While there is no separate process for drugs for rare disorders, those with orphan drug status are eligible for a fast track process. So in other words, they get prioritized for review. Uh, the ministry takes into account similar factors for all drugs, disease severity, uh, special needs of particular groups, incremental clinical benefit, need to limit pharmaceutical expenditures, uh, availability of alternatives and innovativeness, uh, which means alters the course of illness, budget impact and cost efficiency analyses. If the ministry makes a positive funding decision, a ceiling price is set following a cost plus system where maximum list price should reflect the complete cost of the product plus a given profit margin, which should lie within 12 and 18%. But prices in other EU, EU countries are also taken into account. 
At the regional level, HTA bodies provide assessments to inform their negotiations around the price actually pay, pay, sorry, paid, which often involves discounts and real world evidence agreements or managed access programs. Now, importantly, if the National Ministry of Health issues a negative funding decision, the drug cannot be provided by regional health authorities. Some regions have developed separate processes for ultra rare diseases. So for example, in Catalonia, it has the Catalan Managed Access Program, which involves an HTA committee that includes rare uh, disease experts and patients. Okay, so I think we're gonna be ready for our first polling question. So all of you know how polls work. We're gonna put up the question you'll have some limited amount of time to actually uh, submit your answers and then we will uh, come back with the answers and then I'm going to open it up and ask the panel to respond. I know that um, uh, Tanya is on with us. She's on the phone uh, and not able to get in on the video. I think because she says the uh, internet capacity at the University of Alberta is not up to speed and she didn't have time to drive to a parking lot at Starbucks. So we'll put up with the fact that we will just hear her and not see her. Okay, first question. A new drug works best at early stages of severe disease. Um, it could prolong life by months. Um, it is much more expensive than current therapies, but it has a low budget impact because the numbers are small. Which country's access pathway would give the best access? Not to say there's a right answer, but in your opinion, where would you go? Or if you were a patient, where would you wanna be in order to get the best access to this new drug? It works best at early stages, it's severe progressive disease, could prolong life by months, so that's kind of the limitation around it. Where do you want to go? What would you like to do? France, no HTA. Germany, no HTA, immediate access at full price. The UK, no HTA, but refer to a specialized expert committee. Italy, where you can get innovative status and get access through a managed access scheme. Or Spain, where you've got to go through the uh, therapeutic process of, of assessment first and then negotiate with different um, regions. Where do you want to go? And uh, when we get to a critical mass, I think uh, we will close the poll. So give your best shot at it, and then we'll ask our panel to jump in as well. Be brave. There's no wrong answers. We just need to get a sense of where would you like to go. We don't have Canada on here, so we can think about it in a future Come in, everybody pump in there, just dump in a vote and let's see what we can do here. Angela, we need to get a theme song so that we can play this in the background. Like Jeopardy? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, we need a theme song. Yeah, all right. All right. Okay, I'll work on that for the next one. Thank you. How about all right. staying alive? <laughs> Grim thought, <laughs> but I like it. Okay, staying alive would work. <laughs> oh, maybe somebody can hum. <laughs> All right, why don't we uh, close off the poll here and we'll show up, put the results up. All right, we can see the results here. So um, almost half of you, 40% or I mean 60% said I kind of like to go, or more than half, so sorry, would say I'd start with Germany. Maybe a quarter or fifth said I think we take France. So both of these are countries with no HTA and immediate access. Uh, the UK, because of their specialized committee, and some people would say we'll go to Italy. It's got innovative status. We could get a managed access scheme. Nobody obviously wanted to, uh, to go to Spain, which smacks a little bit of Canada. So um, I'm going to, uh, we'll leave it up there for a second. And maybe um, instead of going to Tanya, I'm going to actually pivot to Norm, who's there, you know, as an industry rep. Um, yeah, I don't know which one you chose. You don't have to fess up which one you chose. But what do you think mm -hmm. of the, what do you think of the presentations? What, what do you think of the results? Does this make sense to you? Would you agree? So the results make sense to me. Um, Duran, I maybe just preface my comments by saying um, that was just a huge wealth of information provided by, by Tanya and a lot for everyone to digest. So I'm also viewing things a little bit through the prism of Takeda's um, uh, analysis of a number of these markets and our understanding of a number of these markets as well. And 
and, and then in the context of your, your introduction, which best practices might actually be adaptable for Canada as we begin to make proposals for a, a national rare disease strategy. So I, I'm most familiar with uh, France. I, I'll I'll admit I chose France simply because I, I, I think Germany has just such a blunt instrument um, in allowing uh, any drug uh, reimbursement at um, uh, market authorization. I'm just not sure of the um, probability of a mechanism like that being adopted in a country like Canada. Um, but France, if you look at across multiple policy areas um, in access um, from early entry to um, uh, progressive HTA processes, and uh, then a balanced uh, reimbursement policy. I, I think there's no doubt why it, 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 it follows closely uh, behind Germany uh, in the ranking of European markets where there's very high rate of reimbursement and very uh, quick uh, speed to access. Great. Okay. So Ken, I'm going to pivot to you and you can even reflect in terms of the diseases that you want, but maybe you can introduce yourself real briefly um, and uh, tell me what you think and whether or not you agree with what our polls are saying. Sure. Um, Ken Chapman, uh, professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and the rare disease with which I deal is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So something that tends to cause premature emphysema in those who have it, as well as other problems. Um, what strikes me is that the audience, um, I think, has voted for reassessment, um, whether that's in one year in Germany or five years in France, and that appeals to me. I will tell you as somebody who's done research for a very long time that, <sighs> declaration here, I'm a very slow learner. I was about 20 years into my career when I realized that drugs that I was studying in clinical trials were seldom being used the way they were developed and tested. Um, and I speak now of common everyday drugs. Um, when they are approved by Health Canada, the FDA, EMA, they are approved on the basis of results in a few thousand people. The drug does something that's thought to be useful and doesn't cause horrible and obvious side effects. After that, it's kind of a learner's permit. We figure out how to use the drug. Um, that whole lack of information and the need for further study, um, people in the industry would use the jargon phase four study or post-marketing study, is done abysmally across the board, and it's especially true of rare diseases. So I'll shut up and say my bottom line is I like the pathways that have um, the, the manufacturer, the patients, and the government working in partnership to learn the real lessons once the drug enters the real world. Perfect, okay, great. I'm not gonna to go to everybody because we wanna get through some of the other uh, parts of this presentation. That was the heaviest uh, low dump in terms of, of, uh, of information, but we've got more to come. Okay, so Ange, if you could um, can you give us the next um, segment here. So let's take a moment to summarize what we've learned so far and just look at decision-making factors considered during pricing and reimbursement processes for the drugs for rare diseases in these five European countries. First, in terms of therapeutic value, in France and Germany, it's considered proven at regulatory approval as long as a certain budget impact isn't exceeded. Remember that regulatory approval is what a drug needs in order for it to be sold in a country. So the job of a regulatory body is to ensure a product is safe and of high quality. Safe means that the potential benefits have been deemed to outweigh the potential harms. In the UK, Italy, and Spain, therapeutic value is determined based on clinical studies. All three focus on outcomes related to impact on patients and they'll accept direct health-related patient reported outcomes. Only the UK considers impact on families and caregivers. Unsurprisingly, all of them consider unmet need, which is often operationalized through a willingness to accept greater uncertainty around clinical effectiveness. While all of the countries may consider value for money through cost effectiveness or cost efficiency analyses, it's only the UK that specifies 
and ICER threshold range that they use to get an idea of whether a drug should be considered cost effective. In terms of cost or budget impact, as I mentioned previously, two countries use that explicit budget impact to determine the extent to which the drug needs further review before a reimbursement and pricing decision uh, is made. In the rest of the countries, budget impact is considered alongside other factors. All countries take into account innovativeness. Now for France and Italy, the pathway that most ultra rare disease drugs takes is one for all innovative drugs. In Spain and the UK, innovativeness is an actual decision-making factor uh, that decision-making committees use during deliberations. Typically, innovativeness is a combination of unmet need, so lack of alternatives, added therapeutic value, and quality of evidence. In all but one of the countries, the target population size, meaning an explicit number, is taken into account. The exception is the UK's highly specialized technologies program, which instead says the target patient group for the technology in its license indication is so small that treatment will usually be concentrated in very few centers in the NHS. All five countries manage uncertainty through a request for follow-up real-world evidence as part of or separately from a managed access program. So value assessment is therefore adaptive and continuous. We'll talk uh, uh, more about uh, managed access programs in a moment. Okay. I I apologize, I prematurely stopped that presentation because I wanna to go to the poll for a second and uh, let's see if we can get your answers onto this next question and get the panel back in. So we've got, a, this is a second drug. So a rare condition, this is the second drug to come into market for this condition. It is an oral drug versus the older drug, which is an infusion therapy. The trials were done as a placebo controlled, randomized controlled trials, but there were no head to head trials. It had showed marginally greater efficacy as measured by the biomarkers. It demonstrated improved quality of life rating as measured by uh, quality of life scales. The estimated ICER for this was about 100,000 euros. The budget impact that was low, less than 10,000. What would you recommend in terms of the countries to vote to? Okay, so let's see people voting on this. We'd go to Germany, Spain, Italy, France, or to the UK. So not likely to have a breakthrough status, unless we count quality of life. I'm gonna get people to hurry up and put your entries in so that we can get through some summaries here. We always say there's no wrong answers. There's no universally right answers. I'll give you 10 more seconds. I think we've stopped uh, getting new responses. So Ange, can you just share the results? Okay, so again, people kind of like Germany. Negotiate the price, collect real world outcomes and renegotiate out a year. Um, kind of like France, where you could submit for the health technology assessment because it is a second to therapy and then negotiate the price. Italy, in terms of negotiating, collecting real world evidence, uh, but Italy does have a process for using patient reported outcomes, which may not be elsewhere. Okay. I'm actually going to pivot to Deanna. Okay, can you tell me kind of what you feel about what was um, presented, and to what degree do you um, agree with what the um, our participants said in terms of their choice? Would you go there? 
I'm again, Angela. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm mixing your first name and your last name. That's why you're looking at it. It happens all the time. I know, I know. <laughs> People should not have two almost first names. <laughs> so I, I, I think um, if I was speaking on behalf of alpha one patients, you know, this is a disease with a long clinical course. So to have a therapy and then assess it in such a short term, it, it, you, it's not a fair assessment. Um, I think. Dr. Chapman could probably speak a little more to that, but there, I don't think you'd get the results you wanted. Um, I agree, I also picked Germany, um, but uh, when it comes to alpha one, you're not, you're not gonna get those results. And I think that's probably fair to say with a lot of other diseases. Okay, so the likelihood that you're gonna show that significant impact at one year is gonna be, and we have had challenges as some people would know in terms of Germany dumping the drug or you know really lowering the price because at one year, especially with using biomarkers, you didn't actually get that. Yeah. Tanya, are you on the line? Can you kind of jump in here for us? Yeah, I, I actually think I would hedge my bets on Germany over France because I am not sure given that there may be a perceived view that there is an alternative. I think your chances are better that it would fare better through Germany than France. Because actually what would happen in Germany, Germany doesn't necessarily, um, you know, the issue with Germany is not that you would expect to see a significant benefit in what you're thinking in one year. It's about um, whether they feel, so again, if that, and remember, if that budget impact stays under uh, the threshold, it doesn't matter. So, uh, my concern more would be that in France, it may not meet uh, the criteria as being an innovative drug. Um, whereas in Germany, um, if that had just received, if that drug had received orphan drug status, that doesn't matter. As long as it stays under the budget impact threshold, you're good to go in Germany beyond the year. Okay, this is a good information to know in terms of the nuances. So people for various reasons kind of got it right. Let's see if we can move on then. I'm gonna see if we can get uh, Angela, if you can put up a D at the next segment because we're gonna run out of time here. <clears throat> so what about the availability of real world evidence-based decision options or managed access agreements in these countries? Well, let's compare how they use real world evidence agreements to provide access to some drugs for rare diseases in order to um, address decision uncertainties. All five countries do use this option to some extent, but they're called different things and whether they build in outcomes guarantees for continued funding at a particular price varies. In the UK, the highly specialized technologies program has patient access schemes that come in two forms. First, there are those that require evidence collection because of clinical uncertainty, where predetermined criteria are set for getting onto and staying on therapy and data are collected over a fixed period of time of usually five years. Then there are those that are simply financially based. Since the introduction of the ICER threshold, the majority of drugs reviewed by the highly specialized technologies program have resulted in patient access schemes that involve straight discounts. In Germany, sickness funds enter into these arrangements with manufacturers and they usually require collection of additional clinical evidence through registries, which are analyzed over a fixed period of time. The prices are then adjusted in light of the additional evidence, but there aren't necessarily um, ties to an outcomes guarantee where it is determined ahead of time what and how much clinical benefit needs to be realized in order to pay a certain price for a drug. In Italy, prices are used extensively, sorry, registries are used extensively to collect data as part of risk sharing arrangements, which is another name for managed access programs or patient access schemes. And they may be tied to achieving specific health outcomes or financial outcomes or not. In Spain, regions such as Catalonia have entered into these arrangements as well, typically tied to registries with outcomes guarantees. Now, whether or not payers enter, the, enter into these types of agreements depends on the uncertainty they see around the decision and their willingness to accept different amounts of uncertainty. It also depends on the existing capacity and infrastructure to collect the evidence in a timely and efficient way. 
Countries that already have registries, either disease specific or drug based ones are going to find these arrangements much more feasible to enter into. For example, France funds a lot of disease based registries through centers of excellence, so they already exist when a drug comes along whose real world effectiveness could be assessed using one of these registries. Italy, on the other hand, also has a national prescribing uh, registry for all drugs, making it much more feasible for them to enter into these arrangements. In general, patients have not been involved in the design of, of the agreements themselves. And the reason for that varies. Where agreements are linked to existing registries, the idea is to use the outcomes already collected in those registries. Now, in other cases, the view is that patient input has already been sought during the actual review process, so decision makers already have an understanding of what's meaningful or important to patients and families. Even in the UK's highly specialized technologies program, the design and terms of real world evidence based agreements do not directly involve patients. Okay, I think we have time to squeeze in just one more poll and get some comment on it, if we can. Um, there's actually more to the presentations. Tanya has a huge presentation for us. Okay, so we've got here, this is the first drug for an ultra rare condition. It has an estimated ICER of over 500,000 euros. It is a lifetime usage. So a one-time usage, we believe. Oh no, sorry, sorry, it's not one time. Use, it has to be used throughout the patient's lifetime has an annual budget of slightly less than 30 million euros, variable clinical trial bar, um, biomarker outcomes because the patient population is somewhat varied. There's high evidence uncertainty. So uh, because of these clinical trials with populations, the EMA is given it orphan status with conditional marketing authorization. Where would you go to choose to introduce the drug? You're gonna introduce that drug, where are you gonna go? So it's the first drug, very high ICER, has to be used throughout the lifetime. I say good, moderately high uh, budget impact, but there's high uncertainty in terms of the, um, the outcomes because of the, the variability in the population. And we seem to have only uh, biomarkers, but EMA is given it conditional market authorization. So we're gonna have to do something about post-market. Where do you wanna go? This is a tough one, so really, you know, requires a little bit of reading and thinking. Where do you want to go with this? Ultra rare. Give it a little bit more time. There truly is no right or wrong answers, but we'll give it 10 more seconds and then we'll close the poll and get some responses back. We just have time maybe to finish this off. Okay. And you want, yeah, share the results here. Okay, so we had a real interest in going to France. Um, we've got um, somewhat of a tie between Italy and Germany. So we negotiate the, both of them with the managed access scheme, uh, but um, Italy with patient reported outcomes and um, the UK. Well, okay, we had a dead tie between the UK, Italy and Germany. All right, um, who wants to comment on this? I'll throw it open to my panel. Who would like to give us a response back on this? Okay, Ken, go. Um, I. I um, say that I'm delighted people picked up on Angela's comment that it can take longer than one year to look for outcomes. I share Angela's bias. We both deal with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and yeah, it takes longer than a year, and I think that's often the case. Um, the second thought is that the disease aside, diagnostic approaches and therapeutic approaches change, and we may see clinicians dealing with the disease differently at the three, four, five-year mark post-introduction to the marketplace. And I think if you really want real world evidence, you have to take that into account as well. So I love the reassessment. I like the five-year timeframe. And yeah, who doesn't like France and baguettes and good wine? 
<laughs> okay, well, I'll pivot to Norm. You know, what do you think in terms of the poll, in terms of Ken's response as well? Duran? Norm? You're on mute. Are, are you, Norm, are you with us? Can you speak? No, no, I think it's just because I've got three kids at home who are all doing um, at-home at school learning. So it was maybe just my Wi-Fi that dropped. Okay. Um, Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, yeah, no, I thought uh, uh, that was that was interesting. I was trying to um, consider all of the facts we'd learned through Tanya's presentations. And uh, well, I didn't choose a specific country. Some of the things I was looking um, uh, for, um, given the ultra rare you know status and the fact that this was the first drug, is markets that um, re reward or value uh, innovation. So where you'd have a high innovation score and might be able to accelerate through the HTA process. Um, I, 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 it, I think we need to understand, you know, the process uh, in some markets better. Um, if you're right at um, that 30 um, uh, uh, threshold, um, are you considered um, within or, or, or above? Um, markets that um, don't require uh, cost effectiveness analysis or that you use an ICER, I think would be um, preferable. And uh, again, I, I like, you know, France's balanced approach to funding um, following sort of an affordability uh, approach and then reimbursing based on, on medical benefit. So. Great. Good summary. I'm going to pivot to our real expert though. Um, Tanya, what do you think? You know, did, did we get it? Is anywhere close to being right? Because you also have hidden information sometimes. Uh, Tanya had to jump off. Well, Tanya, that's right. She had to leave. I forgot about that. So, Deanna, I get let give it to you. You, you can kind of give us a final opinion, and then we'll kind of wrap up in terms of where we're going next. I'll use my alternate name, Diana. Oh, God, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I also picked France. Um, again, it, it was clear that it's it's the first therapy. Um, and when there's no alternative therapy, when another one doesn't exist, I think that that's the key here. And I think Canada could learn a lot by what uh, France has been doing. And I, I'm hoping that's the takeaway today is uh, that the system here is broken. And uh, I, I, I think hopefully everyone leaves today taking some of France, <laughs> uh, France's lessons um, and apply them as we develop a strategy or framework. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're gonna take the uh, suggestions for what we should call it. Is it strategies, is it a framework, is it an office, is it a program? But uh, beyond that, uh, really wanna thank everybody for their active participation and especially Tanya, who I've forgotten, she did need to leave about five minutes early. There's more to her presentation, which we might pick up on later. We are going to do some additional presentations, comparisons of which drugs actually get access. You know, how do, you know, it's one thing to get them listed, it's another to get access, time to access. We'll have some comparisons again, um, especially with Canada. And also which drugs actually come into Canada. That has been a big concern. Um, I think we can all see that Canada, unfortunately, reflects a little bit of what Spain is. And that makes it a little bit daunting, I think, for some companies to really think of Canada as our first entry. And does the PMPRB make it even more vulnerable for us in terms of early entry? So all of that will be some of the topics that we will be thinking about in terms of our future webinars, but especially for our Rare Disease Day conference on uh, March 9th and 10th. So hopefully we'll have a more opportunity to explore some of these things. Um, it is, I think, important, and I really appreciate very much time you taking that deep dive because it's one thing to just say, okay, we should just do it like this. The other thing I think we're going to be saying in terms of our submission is that there is no one pathway. It depends on the drug. It depends on the condition. It depends on where the place in therapy might be that we may want to have a program that would have alternative pathways, maybe a little bit like the UK, um, but um, maybe even more crisply defined than that. The other thing we are going to want to push for is to think about that ICER. If it's used, what should it be? And the last thing I will say is that we will come back and think about, is there a cutoff, you know, in terms of annual budget impact that we like Germany or France would be able to say, you know, we don't need to do it all in HGA. Or if it's an urgent, as uh, Angela just said, right name, <laughs> that if it's an urgent needed first drug, you know, do we really need to drag it through that process before we make access? So huge thanks to everybody in terms of the participation. We are going to be 
doing another survey. So those of you who responded to our first survey, we appreciate it. It was a very patient-oriented survey. We are going to put another survey out, trying to gather some responses, especially around the proposed um, uh, the discussion guide that Canada's putting out. We are going to, as I say, uh, uh, really focus on our patient training this coming week on the uh, pay discussion guide. And then in our subsequent conference uh, webinar, we are going to really uh, stage it around the discussion guide and hopefully everybody will be able to participate. And just a quick shout out to PM, uh, to uh, INC, um, which has a webinar coming up uh, right after this. So if you haven't signed up for that, um, I don't know if you still can. I mean, and if you have, we really look forward to seeing you on the other side of this. And I'm going to shut off so that we can make sure that we give IMC their time to get started. So huge thanks to everybody, but especially thanks to Ken, to Angela, and to Norm, and especially to Tanya for making this such a, uh, a an informative and engaging uh, discussion. We got a lot of work cut out for us in terms of figuring out where we're going to go. And as we can see, there's no easy path. There's no easy right answers, but Certainly, the more information that we have, the more we can also participate as informed participants. So huge thanks to everybody. We'll see you uh, again shortly.